The sport of boxing has long been known to attract individuals who have faced adversity and struggle in their lives. The nature of boxing, with its intense physicality and singular focus on one's opponent, can draw in those seeking an outlet for their frustrations and a chance at redemption. For some, the ring becomes a sanctuary, a place where they can prove their worth, find a sense of identity, and escape the troubles that have plagued them. For others, a tainted mind, combined with further damage from the ring, can trigger adverse effects from CTE, leading to behavioral changes, enhanced aggression, impulsivity, and difficulties with impulse control. James Butler from New York City is ranked number eight by the IBF. On the surface, the former super middleweight contender James Butler Jr. shared a similar story of hardship to many of his contemporaries. A tough street kid from New York venting his frustrations in the squared circle, yet, instead of the sport helping him to mature and find self-discipline, it only further fed his psychopathic tendencies, allowing his violent nature to boil over and eventually explode in what has gone on to be remembered as one of the most horrific cases in pugilistic history. Greed, disgrace, and unequivocal violence. BLTV presents The Pure Evil of James the Harlem Hammer Butler. James Butler Jr.'s life before boxing was marked by a challenging upbringing in the streets of Harlem, New York. Growing up in a tough neighborhood known for its poverty and crime, from a young age he was exposed to the harsh realities of street life, including drugs, violence, and involving himself in altercations and clashes with local gangs. However, despite the danger his environment presented, Butler was infamous for coming out of street fights on top, unscathed, often starting and ending his fights in quick succession where many accounts claimed he fought like a wild bull, more than willing to end his opponent's life at the drop of a hat. He was sort of like a Rocky Graziano. Very strong, and uh, threw a lot of punches. Al Gavin, a staple of the New York boxing scene in the early 90s, became aware of the then-teenage butler and knew it was only a matter of time before he ended up in jail or dead. So he took him under his wing, providing him with an outlet for his aggression and a path towards a better life. Boxing offered Butler structure, discipline, and the opportunity to channel his energy into a positive pursuit. Butler only had a handful of fights as an amateur, notably losing to the prominent Darnell Wilson in the 1995 New York Golden Gloves. His major drawback as an amateur was his boxing skills, or lack thereof, as once he came under pressure, he would revert back to his old habits of just swinging for the fences to try and close the show, which wasn't going to cut it against the well-disciplined and sharply honed skills that the average contestant in such prominent tournaments possessed. No, Butler had a style that was certainly more geared towards the pros, similar in style to the modern-day heavyweight Deontay Wilder, wild and ungainly, but with the power to erase the skill gap in the blink of an eye. Butler won his first two professional fights before he matched up with another local club fighter by the name of Richard the Alien Grant. Grant was a talented boxer, but garnered the majority of his following due to his Jamaican heritage and charismatic personality, notably choosing a different colored hairstyle for each bout. There was no footage from the contest, but it was said to have been a wild and heated affair where both men gave their all over the scheduled four rounds. Richard Grant, being the more experienced of the two, edged out the narrow decision, which did hurt Butler, but never deterred him from pushing forward from what many could see was a promising future. Round number two underway between Sosa and Butler. And Sosa getting rocked to start round two, and he takes an uppercut and a combination and goes down. Good, impressive effort by James Butler. He had a big step up in class. Butler's most significant turning point was stepping up the number of rounds, from six to eight, to eventually 10 and 12. He was a slow starter, but had a great engine and substantial stopping power down the line. The loss to Grant became his only setback inside his first 18 fights, where he went on an impressive knockout streak by beating top super middleweight contenders such as Murky Sosa, Bryant Branning, and Arthur Allen, all of which were much more revered than Richard Grant, whose career trajectory had now taken a deep dive into the journeyman classification. Still involved in big fights, but now brought in as an opponent, more or less, paid to lose. The Harlem Hammer, James Butler. After an impressive win streak, Butler finally came unstuck against the IBF super middleweight champion Sven Otke in late 2001, where once again, the classy boxing skills of Otke caused frustration for Butler as his crude attempts to set up a decisive knockout shot were easily evaded by the undefeated German, as he soundly outboxed Butler over the distance. 
Otki retired as an undefeated world champion, so it wasn't a massive slight for Butler as he planned to rebuild his career and work toward fighting another belt holder, perhaps Joe Calzaghe at 168 or Roy Jones Jr. at 175. A good place to start the rebuild was against his old foe, Richard Grant. There was history there, and despite being on different career paths, both had a niche fan base that, combined, could generate a decent amount of traction and revenue while equally offering Butler a chance at redemption. James Butler, the 28-year-old former USBA super middleweight champ, Owns a record of 18 and two as a professional with 12 knockouts. We saw the stage was set at the Roseland Ballroom in Manhattan, New York on November 23rd, 2001. The bout was set up as a charity event for the surviving firefighters and police officers of the unfortunate. There were no titles on the line and Grant was seen as a significant underdog, having lost three of his last five fights. For Butler, it was a simple chance of redemption, right or wrong, and move on to bigger and better things. A must-win fight. Touch, touch the gloves. Touch them up. Come Mike in. wants touch them up. Touch it up. Fight. Forces them to. On the old ESPN Top Rank series. Movement is the way to go when you're fighting Butler. Butler, a man who has tremendous power, but not a very busy fighter. From the first bell, Butler's limitations as a boxer were exposed, as Grant came in with a game plan to box and move without leaving an opening for the former world title challenger. He could be paralyzing. But right now, the man who's in charge, as we thought might happen, is Grant. The frustration and anger from Butler was building throughout the contest, as Grant racked up every round in style, offsetting the Harlem Hammer's rhythm with sound defensive work, flurries off the back foot, and subtle taunts to keep the crowd engaged in what was becoming a one-sided lackluster affair. Butler truly looking confused and frustrated with Grant's style. Butler was down a minimum of eight rounds as the fight came to a close, and while there were a few opportunities to capitalize on Grant's mistakes, his one-dimensional nature as a fighter held him back from doing what many other capable boxers have done to Grant in the past, correctly set up the knockout shot. Open, got tagged, Butler too wild though, and there's the bell to end it. It was a foregone conclusion as Michael Buffer read out the whitewashed scorecards, and Grant was already celebrating his victory. But then, in a bizarre moment of madness, Butler unleashed one final shot to vent his frustration built throughout the night's action. Whoa! Butler just ran across Butler, the ring! Butler just went over there and sucker punched, sucker punched and knocked out Grant. Never! That's assault! That is assault! He should be arrested on the spot! He should be arrested right on the spot. That is assault and battery. A disgraceful, cowardly act that led to Butler indefinitely losing his boxing license and subsequently being sent to prison for first degree assault. Thankfully, Grant made a full recovery from the cheap shot, but had to undergo surgery for a broken jaw, which in turn made sure Butler would serve his full sentence of six months at the Rikers Island detention facility. Upon Butler's release from jail, the New York State Athletic Commission decided to reinstate the former world title challenger's license, giving Butler, now in his early 30s, one last chance to earn a living while he was still in his prime athletic years. Surprisingly, the large majority of the boxing community welcomed Butler back with open arms. After all, incidents such as this had happened on many occasions in the past, where most of the offending fighters were let off without any repercussions at all. Something the renowned boxing figure Max Kellerman described in intricate detail in an article published for ESPN one week after the Butler-Grant rematch in 2001. When I first stumbled across this article, I was stunned. Max's take here wasn't at all what I was expecting, and certainly contrasted the views of ESPN sports media counterparts who, likely still in shock from the event, vilified Butler for his disgraceful actions. Max did make some good points here. But as further research into this topic led me to realize, his position likely came from a place of bias, as it appears Butler was more than just another fighter to scrutinize. In fact, all roads lead to a lengthy personal relationship between the two, long before Max's prominence as a writer and Butler's notoriety as a prize fighter. Mm. 
This part of the story takes us back to the early 90s where a young, inspired, and vastly intelligent Max Kellerman, alongside his brother Sam, who by all accounts was equally driven and astute as his sibling, were trying to find their way in the sports media industry. I stated that, the, that Pernell Whitaker was the best fighter in the world pound for pound in 1989 on my very first show. By the mid-90s, despite still only being a teenager, Max made his way onto public access television, where he hosted a show known as Max on Boxing. His brother Sam, on the other hand, seemed to be growing into his own as a personality of screen, gaining notoriety for his brilliance as a young writer. Sam was also interested in boxing and various other art forms, such as rap music. He and his brother even formed a rap duo known as Sam and Max. The song, titled Young Man Rumble, was released in 1994 and became their most popular hit. The boxing-related track had its fair share of radio play, and the video even featured on popular music-related cable channels in the U.S. But objectively, my brother Sam was also a genius. He's a brilliant guy. Here is where things get weird. In the back of that music video, or at least somewhere on the set this was filmed, was an amateur boxer from Harlem named James Butler Jr. And this wasn't a random coincidence. Sam, more so than his brother Max, considered Butler one of his best friends, where the two built a strong bond rebounding off their vastly different personalities. Butler was enthralled by Sam's intelligence, drive, and caring persona, while Sam gravitated toward Butler for his competent skills as a boxer and tough man aura. It was an unusual friendship pairing, but appeared functional from the outside looking in. However, Max saw a different side to Butler and felt he was manipulating and steering Sam onto a more negative life path. But as you can tell by the article he published after Butler sucker punched Grant, he was still trying to do a solid for his brother by attempting to make life easier for a man that he didn't truly respect in the first place. Butler and Sam remained close friends for a long time, all the way through to post-incarceration. Butler may have got his license back, but his credibility in the sport was finished. Even after what appeared to be a reasonably sincere public apology to Grant upon his return to the ring, what credible promoter would want to work with him? Yet, boxing being boxing, the sport still managed a way to get Butler back in the ring. However, after years of inactivity, it was clear he no longer had the sharpness to compete with the division's upper echelon, pretty much excluding him from making a livable wage in the sport without becoming a punching bag for every young prospect on the rise. During the winter of 2004, Butler was at an all-time low. He could no longer rely on his talents as a boxer to fund his lifestyle. So, he turned to his old friend Sam for help, and being the sort of guy he was, Sam allowed him to stay at his apartment rent-free until he found his way back to his feet. Days turned to weeks and weeks turned to months. But Butler had become lazy and unwilling to create a new path for himself, at which point Sam was left with no choice but to ask his friend to leave. How that exact interaction went is unknown, but we have seen how Butler reacts when things haven't gone his way in the past. Well, good morning, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Homicide detectives are still here at the scene. In October 2004, as Sam Kellerman had his back turned to work on a write-up piece for Fox Sports at his desktop computer, James Butler approached him from behind and struck him, not once, not twice, but 32 times to the head with a hammer, instantly killing his oldest and closest friend. In a moment of panic, Butler dropped the murder weapon and stole Sam's car keys before setting fire to the apartment in a shoddy attempt to try and cover his tracks. It took a few days for the police to discover the crime scene, but once they did, the lead detective, Gennaro Estupinian, described the case as possibly the easiest homicide she had ever investigated, as all it took was a brief internet search to realize who Sam Kellerman was and the fact he was living with a violent convicted felon with the nickname the Harlem Hammer. It made it a pretty shut and close case. James Butler handed himself in a few days later, but pled his innocence, suggesting he found Sam that way and drove off in his car to clear his head. The evidence, however, was overwhelmingly against him, and on March 27, 2006, he was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, arson, and burglary, subsequently receiving a sentence of 29 years in federal prison. By all accounts, Sam Kellerman was a great man, unquestionably on a path to achieve amazing things in his career. He left behind a loving family that still heavily mourns his unfortunate passing to this day. My thoughts go out to all those affected by this tragedy. The idea of losing a loved one for such senseless reasons in such heartless fashion is beyond comprehension. Rest in peace.